Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm gonna to be taking your questions on seat belts, power probes, oil changes, and more. This is episode 148 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Be sure to put question for Charles in the subject. Also, ask your question right at the top, Mash the enter button a few times, then give me the paragraph of details. That helps me answer your questions quite a bit faster. And before we get into the show, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, let's get in to the questions. First one comes from Josh. Says, hey Charles, I have an 03 Jetta 1.8 Turbo Tiptronic tonight, and every so often I feel the trans struggle a bit. I'm worried it might be really ugly if it breaks. Anything I can do to prevent something from happening? Uh, well, Josh, so we have a 13 year old car with an automatic transmission. That generation of Volkswagen automatic transmission was really quirky anyway. You know, my B5 Passat, which is a totally different transmission gets a little weird sometimes too, where, you know, if I'm slowing down and then speed back up, it'll get a little bit of a harsh shift because basically what's happening is the transmission doesn't know what I'm doing. It sees me, you know, with a period of time slowing down and then I wrap the throttle again. It has to downshift or upshift or it doesn't know what the heck it's doing, right? So it takes a second and then it goes or the shift is a little awkward because it was thinking I was doing one thing and then it, I decided to do something different. So we need to see if it's a situation like that or if we really do have a problem with the transmission. Now, from a dealership standpoint, there's not a whole lot of repairs on automatic or manual transmissions from Volkswagen at this point, right? The newest generation. Sure, these parts are available and sure, a lot of dealerships have technicians that can fix these and take them apart, put them back together, everything will be cool. But a lot of times what we do as technicians with transmission repairs, and I know this is slightly off topic, but just so more of an FYI, is we weigh what it costs to repair it versus replace it. And if it's gonna be about 80% to repair as it would replace, we put a new one in. And there's a ton of reasons, warranty, uh, less likelihood of having an issue, less likely of taking it apart and finding more damage than we expected. So, um, you know, just kind of keep that in mind too. But as far as what you can do about it, man, you could put some new fluid in it. You could change the fluid out and see what happens. I've, I've found that that rarely works uh, to do a, flu, a full fluid exchange. You probably want to check the fluid level though and make sure that it's at the correct level. It can be low and that'll cause weird shifts on cold, uh, a cold condition. But as far as like, you know, Josh, all you have to do is don't drive it over 30 or, you know, whatever, don't drive it over 30. Uh, man, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know that there's anything you're going to be able to do to save the damaged transmission if that's what's going on. What I might consider doing is maybe drive it in Tiptronic a little more and see if that overcomes the objection, uh, the objectionable shifts on your car. You, you never know. You never know what it's going to take to get it out of its weird zone. You can also disconnect both terminals, both terminals, both terminals, both terminals of the battery and hold them together or take a jumper wire or something and put them together. Just make sure there's no possible way for the posts to go back on the batteries. You know, stuff a towel under them or something like that. And do that for a minute or so, or you can even do it overnight. And that, that sort of reboots everything. Maybe it got some kind of weird learned behavior that it's, that it's developed and it just needs to be reset. So, man, I would try those two things, or three things. Fluid level, uh, battery voodoo, disconnect the cables, touch them together and maybe a full fluid exchange. And other than that, there's probably not a whole lot you're really gonna be able to do about it. All right, next one comes from Steve. What's your opinion on the Power Probe hook? I've been thinking of upgrading my Power Probe 3 and I'm deciding if I want the four or the hook. So you guys know I am a Power Probe fan, right? I live and die, not really, but I live by this Power Probe. It's one of my favorite tools, period, in my toolbox. Now. Steve's upgrading from a three to a four. I'm still way back on the two, which was basically something just to check power ground fuses and you could also power components with it. Awesome tool, absolutely love it. Uh, I've talked about it. I'll link up the video, you know, whatever side it links up in, if you guys wanna know more about the Power Probe and how I truly do feel about them, but I think I did a pretty good job just saying it. Uh, as far as going with the four 
or the hook. So I also have the hook. And if this tells you anything, and I like it, it works fantastic, but it is not traditionally what I think of anyway as a power probe, right? It is, it is more than a power probe. But I think the 4, the Power Pro 4, does just about everything that the hook does. So if it were me, I would be going with the 4. I found that the hook is slow to respond when I want to do something very, very rapidly, like check fuses, where I just want to plug it in and bip, 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 check my fuses. I didn't find that it was actually great for that, but it does so much more that, you know, it's still such a powerful tool. I would think that if I were going to maybe get the hook, I wouldn't replace one of my other power probes with it. I would bring it into the family and have it as another diagnostic tool. I would have it you know, alongside a power probe 2, power probe 3, power probe 4, whatever you prefer. But dude, I would get the 4. I wouldn't think twice about it. I would yeah, I'll link up the 4 in the description if you want. That way you can just go right there, click it, buy it on Amazon. It's probably on Prime like I don't know 150 bucks or whatever. Uh, whatever it is priced at today. But it, it is such a fantastic tool, and the 4 does so much more than the 3 did, and more than the 2 did. I mean, the my 2 basically, you know, again, doesn't do a ton of stuff compared to what they do now. So, highly recommend getting the 4. Nothing wrong with the hook, not hating on it at all. I think it's a very good tool, but that is more of an alongside of a power probe tool, in my opinion, not replacing the little power probe tool. All right, next one comes from PT. My Jetta hood won't shut after I change the oil, and I've been trying to figure out whether the lower receiver is bad or the front or rear cable or all of the above. Sprayed PB blaster as there is some rust, put a screwdriver into the lower receiver to mimic the hood, and nothing clicks or locks. Does this point to the receiver being faulty? I assume the cable is detached from the receiver that would prevent unlocking the hood, but would not have anything to do with why the hood, when pushed into the receiver, doesn't click into the lock position. So PT has an 08 Jetta. I actually took a look at the GTI, which is sitting right on the other side of the camera, which I'm still a little sad that it's not the Cabrio, but anyway, I uh, took a look at the GTI. Now, the GTI and that 08 Jetta are a little bit different, but essentially they work the same. There's basically two locks. There's the lock that holds the hood shut and all the way down, closed completely, and then there's the secondary lock. So when you pull the hood cable and the hood pops up, there's a second lock that you have to manually squeeze. On the Jetta, it's attached to the hood. On the GTI, it's attached to the hood latch. Uh, you squeeze it, and then you can raise the hood. What I've seen more than anything is if you look straight down at the hood latch, the secondary lock and the primary lock will actually separate a little bit, and there'll be a gap. You know, there'll be a gap like that big, and that's enough to make the hood not shut. You mentioned rust. That can lead to it. You know, maybe the last time you had the hood up, you slammed it and it tweaked that latch and then it opened fine, but now it's not really happy. And I've had customers' hoods where it's taken me like 15 minutes to shut the dang hood, you know, longer to change the, uh, or to shut the hood than it was to change the oil. So this happens. Um, can you fix it? You could, you can try, you can tweak those pieces back together. I haven't had very good luck with it. It's a lot of riveting, so you really can't disassemble it. You can and you can fix it, but you really can't, or maybe better said, you shouldn't. Um, plus, look, this is a safety thing, right? If a hood latch costs you a hundred bucks, that sucks. They're pretty easy to install. It's just to pull the grill out a couple of bolts, usually more hassle screwing around with the release cable than anything. But let's say you fix this and you're driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour and that repair fails. Now you run the risk of your hood flying back and smashing your windshield, which I've seen happen because not every time is that secondary lock enough to hold the hood down when you have air rushing under it and pushing it up. So I wouldn't try and repair it, I would just go ahead and replace it. And odds are, it's the hood latch, not the cable. What you can do is you can, with a second person, have them pull the handle inside the car, and you can look down and see if you see the little release piece moving back and forth, you should see it. You'll see the ball moving or the release pin moving. These cars did have a junction, a cable junction right behind the headlight, which there was a recall on the very early um, Mark, Mark V's, but they can separate from there, but man, usually you don't realize that happened until you go to open the hood and you pull it, uh, pull the pull handle in the car and nothing happens. So I don't think that's what it is. I think you got a bad latch. All right, next one comes from Jeff. I currently have 700 miles on a car and was planning on changing the oil at 1,000, but recently heard somewhere that VW uses break-in oil 
and that I'd be better off waiting until I get up around eight to 10,000 for the first oil change. What would be best for longevity of my car? Um, Jeff, I've changed a lot of oil in a lot of cars over the years. And some of those have been at 1,000. Some of those have been at 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, 14,000, 16,000, and anywhere in between. And I, unless you're waiting to 16,000 miles, which it doesn't sound like you're going to be doing, the uh, service interval on your car should be 10,000 miles. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I would just go ahead and wait to the 10K and, uh, and rock and roll. Now, if you want like extra insurance on longevity, change it at five. Our Tiguan, our 15 Tiguan, two liter turbo TSI, you know, the early variants had, had their issues with timing chain tensioners, may or may not be related to oil. Uh, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole today. I changed it at 10,000 miles. And the reason I waited to 10,000 miles is because we leased it. So in two more years, I'm going to hand the keys back. It's been a great vehicle. Thank you very much. And we're probably going to get something different. But if you're planning on keeping this car, just like if I was planning on keeping that car, I would have done it at five. Is there any need to change the oil at 5,000 miles? Is there any need to change the filter at 5,000 miles because the oil gets bad or the filter gets bad? I don't think so. I think both of those two components are completely capable of holding up for that period of time. But to me, that's a really long time. It's a really long time to get my car up in the air, do an inspection. It's a really long time to leave oil in. I know, right, I know that it can all hold up and it's fine and probably even further out than that. But just like, you know, old timers have that 3,000 mile time uh, oil change interval built in, right, built into their soul, uh, I have the 5,000 mile one kind of built into mine. So it doesn't hurt to do it early, but I wouldn't really think you need to do it as early as, as you're thinking. I do my Passat, which is due every five, I do it at four. The GTI I think was due at like 3,500, but it didn't require synthetic oil. I will be switching to synthetic oil and I'll probably, well, honestly, I'll probably just do it once a year because I don't think I'll put, uh, put 5,000 miles a year on it between the two cars, but you never know, you never know. But at, at most, I'll be doing that at probably 4,000 miles. So Jeff, I don't think there's a need to do it that early. Best case, in my opinion anyway, do it at five, do it at 10, do it at 15, do it at 20, do it at 25 and on up as long as you own the car and rock and roll man don't worry about it you should be just fine all right got time for one more this one comes from paul does vw have a lifetime seatbelt warranty or how can i fix a seatbelt that won't extend hey charles i just brought an 03 jetta tdi wagon that dropped a valve to fix for myself while going through the interior i got home and noticed that the middle seat belt on the rear doesn't extend all the way the seat belts themselves are all gray and in really good condition I'm struggling to find information on the seatbelt tensioner, and I know that many brands have a lifetime warranty on seatbelts, so I just wanted to know if I should just bring it to the dealer when it's all fixed up and have them deal with it for me. Thanks so much. Um, Paul, so VW does not have a lifetime warranty on seatbelts. I've replaced a handful of seatbelts that weren't covered under warranty, oddly enough, mostly due to dogs chewing them, which is always interesting, but... Um, you, you kind of like that last question, right, with the hood latch. You can take that out. It does require disassembling the seat back to get it out. You can take it out and you can probably fix it. I would absolutely not recommend you do that. And for the exact same reason as that hood question, you do not know how that's going to hold up. So picture this. Let me paint, paint the scene for you guys. You got your TDI fixed. You jump in. Wife jumps in. Three kids in the back. Everybody's buckled. Everybody's happy. You slam on brakes, you don't hit anything, right? So pyrotechnics don't go off, you're good. But the seat belts lock, right? When you yank your seat belt, it'll lock, and it's supposed to, whether it's driver side, passenger side, front, rear, or middle. So what happens when the four outer ones lock and the middle one doesn't, and the kid's face goes right into something, right into their knee, right into the center console, who knows? Uh, right into the back of the front seat. Now that person that was sitting in the middle has a busted up face, everybody's fine, but that person got injured in a situation where there should have been zero injury, maybe a spilt coffee at the worst. So I would absolutely not at all, infinity times a billion, consider fixing any seatbelt at all whatsoever. Especially, I mean, if someone's gonna ride in there, you don't want to take the chance. Now, for me, what I do on a lot of my cars, like my cabbies, the back seat belts, they come out. No one's ever going to ride in the back seat, most likely, so I don't feel like it needs it. But with a car like that, someone might. And, well, I mean, riding in the middle sucks anyway, so no one's going to volunteer for that. 
but you don't want to put someone in a position on a seatbelt that you've repaired and risk injury, risk worse. Just don't do it. Now, what I would suggest that you do is call Volkswagen and ask them for some kind of assistance. They may tell you, your car, what year was that car? An 03? Your car's 13 years old, Paul. Sorry, we'd love to help you, but no thanks. Seatbelt will be $350. That's an option. You can call them and ask them and see if they'll help you. Odds are you're probably going to swing uh, swing and a miss on that one. You just bought the car. You know, If you had owned it from new, maybe they would consider But that's a long time ago. For, uh, for Volkswagen to step up. I know other manufacturers do have it. I think Honda Acura is one that has lifetime warranty on seatbelts, which, you know, is a great point, guys. That may be something you want to look at before you buy a new car is things like that. Do they have lifetime seatbelt warranties? You know, who knows? The only way, Paul, you're going to know, my point is, is to call and ask, but I wouldn't really expect that they will. I would expect to go ahead and, and plan for that to have to be fixed. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, you know what to do. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I really do always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at HumbleMechanic.com. Follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and of course, on Snapchat. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Drink of the day is coffee because it's super early. It's even earlier on Sunday morning than I normally roll because uh, this week's going to be a busy week. I think you guys are going to be excited to see what I got going on next weekend or this weekend or next weekend, I guess, technically. So uh, stay tuned and uh, I'll see you guys next time.